others. We talked about Mary. We talked about Mary Magdalene. And so today, today I went to the Old Testament, to Deborah from the Old Testament. Now Deborah's an interesting woman. We don't talk about her much. But all women in Scripture, metaphysically, what is that in me, represent the divine feminine, our feeling nature. And I'm a good example because I am a feeler. You know how you have people that are very mental, people that are feelers, and there's different ways of approaching life. I am a feeler. But there are pros and cons of being a feeler. The pros are I'm very sensitive. The cons are I'm very sensitive. <laughs> And so you can see we can, the feeling nature, I'm not talking about emotions, that's something different, but the feeling nature feels the inner promptings of spirit. But if you're really sensitive, you also feel what's going on in the world, and that can play havoc, can it? So what the story of Deborah does is it tells us how to cope in the world. And don't we all need that? How do you cope? And here there is a story, when you interpret it metaphysically, there's something for everyone. I mean, there are those of you who are excited, oh good, I want to talk about the Divine Feminine today, you know? And there are others who say, oh God, do we have to do that again? <laughs> but for those of you who feel that way, there's wars and killings and blood and guts, so there's something for everybody today in this story. Because if you've ever read the Old Testament, have you noticed? Everybody's always killing everybody else. And when I first started reading the Bible, I thought, I thought it was going to be all sweet and wonderful, and here everybody's getting murdered and killing, and... But when you interpret it metaphysically, it's all in my mind. There are things in my mind that have to go, right? So this story will start to make sense, we hope, as we go through it. Now, first of all, our mind has coping mechanisms, and most of them are what I call my default. My default coping mechanism happens to be hugging dust ice cream. <laughs> um, whole nother story. And it can be drugs, it can be alcohol, it can be ice cream, peanut M&Ms, whatever is your coping method. Everybody here has a different one, right? We could spend an hour sharing what our default is. And many of us that try to get, you know, become better and quit one addiction will just go to another. Mm -hmm. You know, you all know people who quit drinking and start smoking. And you know, people who stop smoking and start eating, or people who try to diet and start shopping. You know, and now we have all the uh, mind-numbing devices like iPhones and iPads and computer games. So there are all kinds of addictions we go to to cope with the world. Do we not? Am I the only one here? No, we all do, don't we? Now there is a spiritual solution. Three parts. To heal the belief underneath the fear, behind the behavior. To heal the belief, underneath the fear, behind the behavior. And there are many stories in the Bible that talk about deliverance. That's a fundamentalist word. People want to be delivered. Well, we, the only thing we have to be delivered from is our own consciousness, our own mind that thinks up all this crazy stuff. And so there's a book in the Bible called the Book of Judges. Now, judges were like, almost like legal experts, so people that everybody went to them for advice. You had a problem, you went to a judge. And here is Deborah, who's a woman. Can you imagine back in Old Testament days, people going to a woman for advice? She must have been amazing. She was part judge, which means discernment, not, oh, I judge you, it means discernment. She was part prophet and part psychic, I'm sure. And this book is often called the 12-step program of the Bible. So you're going to, you 12-steppers are going to love it, the 12-step program in the Bible, okay? Now, metaphysically, again, it's all about me. It's all in my mind. Where do I go for advice in my mind? Where do, do I go to my ego's judgment of what's going on in the world? Or do I go to spiritual discernment? And that's what Deborah represents, spiritual discernment. She goes to that inner feminine feeling nature where she hears the inner promptings from God and speaks truth from there and acts from that place. Now the Israelites needed judges because they were always going on to false gods. You'd think they'd learned after a while. We say that, but have we learned? Are our addictions and bad habits not our false gods? I worship haagen coffee ice cream. It is my God, right? The presence of fear is a sure sign that you're trusting in yourself. 
That's what the Course in Miracles tells us. And it's so easy to fall into a victim consciousness. Oh, the world is doing it to me. That person is doing it to me. Or God help, God is punishing me. In the Old Testament, God was always either blessing them or punishing them. And it was always God doing it to them. It was never the result of their own consequences, of their own actions, their own thoughts, their own what they were doing. So this is what we're trying to switch. And believe it or not, shh, don't tell anybody. There are even unity people that go into victim consciousness, believe it or not. There's even unity ministers that go into victim consciousness yeah, sometimes. Believe it or not here, though, right? <laughs> Now, the book of Judges, here we're going to go now. Hang on to your seat because this is quite a story. There are a lot of characters. You know, don't take notes because there's so many you won't be able to figure it out. But just hang on. We're going to take you on a metaphysical interpretation here, okay? It's going to be quite a ride. It starts, Judges 4, verses 1 through 3. And here we are again. The Israelites, again, did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord sold them into the hand of King Jabin. Do you hear that victim consciousness? I did something wrong, I'm guilty, so God's doing it to me. Do you hear that? Now the commander of his army was Sisera. And the Israelites cried out to the Lord for help. Oh my God, has it come to that? They cried out in prayer. For he, King Jabin, had 900 chariots of iron and had oppressed the Israelites cruelly for 20 years they've been oppressed. And the intimidation of these 900 chariots of iron. So here you are with King Jabin and his uh, general Cicero. Okay, you got that? Now, God is not an outer being punishing us. The only way to handle this story is metaphysically. What is this in my mind? Every person, place, or thing is an aspect of my consciousness. Well, what is a king? A king is what rules us. So what is the ruling factor of your mind? Is it fear? Is it your habits and addictions? Is it other people? What are people going to think? What rules your consciousness? Metaphysically, it's all beliefs that we carry in mind. And a false god is when we are ruled by beliefs that are not of truth, and our thoughts become thoughts of unrest. Unrest leads to habits and addictions. And that would, that's what Sisera represents. Those thoughts of unrest that are the general of our army of thoughts. That's what we have to deal with. Sisera is the head of the army of thoughts of unrest. Now, anybody here get into unrest now and then? Anybody been unrestful for over 20 years? <laughs> I've been a minister for over 20 years. Believe me, I've been in unrest at times. But in numerology, the number 20 is symbolic. In numerology, 20 reduces to 2. And 1 is wholeness. One presence, one power. That's what we say in unity every week. There is only one. One presence, one power. But as soon as you have 2, oops, now you've got duality. Now you've got opposites. Now you've got conflict. So 2 is that separated ego that suddenly no longer believes there is only one, there is separation. Now the Israelites were so afraid to rebel because King Jabin had 900 chariots of iron. And in metaphysics, those 900 chariots of iron represent my own 900 excuses or rationalizations for keeping all those negative habits and thoughts. 900. I can't go out. He's got 900 chariots. I'm going to have some more haagen ice cream. <laughs> or do you say it's just one drink? Gambling doesn't hurt anybody. Shopping's not a bad thing. I need to eat. It's the only way I can cope. Do you hear the 900 rationalizations to keep that negative thinking going in our minds? Okay, let's get back to the story. At that time, Deborah was a prophetess was judging Israel. She was the judge, the leader. And she used to sit under the palm between Ramah and Bethel. Now there you have two, but they mean balance between higher consciousness and spiritual discernment. So she was from a higher consciousness above it all. 
and practice spiritual discernment. And the Israelites came to her for judgments. They had a problem. They went to Deborah because she knew how to solve it. So she sent and summoned Barak, who was the head of the Israelites' army. And she said to them, remember, this is her prophecy. This is the word of God spoken through her. The Lord of the God of Israel commands you, go take position at Mount Tabor, that's a high state of mine, a mountain, bringing 10,000 from the tribe of Naphtali, I can't pronounce that, and Zebulun. And I will draw out Sisera, the general of King Jabin's army. Remember, Sisera is the general of our army of thoughts of unrest. To meet you by the Wadi Kishan, that's a river, with his chariots and his troops, and I will give him into your hand. Barak said to her, if you will go with me, I'll go, but if you don't go with me, I will not go. Oh my, can you imagine the general of an army back then saying to a woman, I won't go if you don't go with me. <laughs> the only way you can interpret that story is metaphysically. The only way. And she said, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, the road on which you are going will not lead to your glory. For the Lord will sell Sisera into the hands of a woman. Okay, that makes for a great story. What is that in B? Barak, remember he's the commander of the Israelite army. He's the, my personal will is my commander. Whatever my will really decides to do, when I will to do something, I do it. People know me, if I really will to do something, I go ahead and do it, I don't back down. And that's the choice to heal negative states of mind. If I really wanted to choose to heal my negative states of mind and stop eating ice cream, I would do it. My personal will hasn't quite got there yet. <laughs> when Jesus used to heal people, he would say to them, do you want to be healed? Because he knew if they didn't want to be healed, if their will wasn't in alignment with that, that no matter what he did, it wouldn't work. So the three steps are to choose it, to will it, and accept it. And the way we say that in unity, I can, I will, I am. Did you hear where we made the decision? I can, I can do this, I will. You hear the choice there? And then I am that. I am that. So repeat with me, I can, I will, I am. One more time, I can, I will, I am. Do you see how our personal will decides when we're going to let go of that negative state of mind and change our way of thinking? Now Deborah is our inner voice of intuition from spiritual discernment that guides our will. The Israelites cried to God for help through her and Deborah sat between Ramah and Bethel in the center of the heart where that which seems separate is now in unity. Do you hear the two now becomes one again in the center of our hearts? That's why we meditate. The two becomes one in the center of our heart. Now, do you, do you feel that healing of separation already starting to come into healing? There is only one problem in the world, and that is the belief that we're separate. And there's only one way to heal it. Be still and know. Peace be still and know that I am God. Deborah is that part of us that's a prophet that hears the word of God and acts from spiritual discernment. Now, she sent for the commander of the Israelite army, Barak, which is the personal will, and gathered the troops from Naphtali and Zebulun that inner strength of spirit. We're all stronger than we think we are. And when we gather those spiritual resources, we are stronger than we think. So the story continues. They're going to meet by the river. Now the river is always the stream of consciousness. So Sisera meets Barak by the stream of consciousness. What does that mean? Our personal will, Barak, meets Sisera feelings of unrest. So here's my will, meeting my feelings of unrest and saying, I'm going to overcome these feelings of unrest. No wonder why there's killing and battle going on, right? That's why the Bible is so full of battles, because a battle happens when the two meet. We choose to heal and repeat again, I can, I will, I am. Here's Barak and Deborah. 
personal will is not going to go without the feminine power of intuition, the spiritual discernment. Now it makes sense. It's not the general of an army saying, I'm not going to go without this woman by my side. It's my personal will saying, I can't do this without spiritual discernment. Believe me, I have tried in my life to do things without spiritual discernment. And it was not pretty how that turned out. So I'm sure you can relate to that. Now, unrest, those feelings of unrest, immediately brings out those 900 excuses. All 900 of them. So the story continues. Sisera called out all his chariots, 900 chariots of iron, and all the troops who were with him to the Wadi Kishan, the stream of consciousness. Our mind brings out all the negative arguments to the river. And then Deborah said to Barak, Lord has given Sisera into your hand. The Lord is indeed going out before you. So Barak went down from Mount Tabor with 10,000 warriors following him. And the Lord threw Sisera and all his chariots and all his army into a panic before Barak. Sisera got down from his chariot and fled away on foot. He ran away while Barak pursued the chariots and the army. And all the army of Sisera fled by the sword. No one was left. They ran away. Very similar to the battle of Jehoshaphat. <coughs> we talked about that before. The battle is not yours. It's God's. Let God do the fighting. Let God do the work in the battle of consciousness. Can't do it alone. If you do, you have every right to be afraid. Now, careful here. Sisera ran away. He wasn't killed. Remember in the first Star Wars movie when Darth Vader ran away at the end? You knew he was coming back because he wasn't killed, right? And this is why, in this one of these stories, that people who take the Bible literally go in and massacre when they're, when they're in war. They massacre the men, women, and children and think everybody has to die. Because in this, if you don't kill everyone, the enemy will come back. And they're not talking about people, they're talking about consciousness. If we don't kill every feeling of unrest, if we don't let go of every fear, if we don't let go of all beliefs of separation, we're going to go back into another state. And that's what it means metaphysically. Now the killing in the Bible makes sense. We want to kill off the, the thoughts and the states of mind that bring us into separation thinking. Okay, the story's almost done. <clears throat> Here's the good part. Now Sisera had fled away on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Haber. So we have another woman in the story. And she came out to meet him and she said to him, turn, turn aside my lord and turn aside to me, have no fear. In other words, I'll protect you. So he turned aside to her into the tent and she covered him up with a rug. And then he said to her, you know, I'm thirsty, can you get me a drink? So she opened a skin of milk and gave him a drink and covered him up again. And he said to her, just stand at the tent, the entrance. And if anybody comes and asks you, is anybody here, just say no. But Jael, a wife of Herbert, took a tent peg and a hammer in her hand and went softly to him and drove the peg into the temple of his head and it went all the way into the ground. He was lying fast asleep and it killed him instantly. There you have it. You think Sigourney Weaver in the movie Aliens was bad. She had nothing on this woman. Now what are they talking about here? Why is this in the Bible? Where do you have to kill the problem? In your mind. The peg in the mind you have, that's where it has to go. It's not killing anybody out there. It's not pointing your finger at anybody out there. It's killing the peg in your head. The story concludes, as Barak came in pursuit of Sisera, Jael went out to meet him and said to him, come and I'll show you the man whom you're looking for. So he went into her tent and there he was, Sisera lying dead with the tent peg in his temple. Now, guess who got the glory for winning the battle? She did. Jael, a woman, got the glory because Deborah, as the prophetess, had predicted the glory will go to a woman. 
Is she talking about an outer woman? She's talking about to the divine feminine within, our voice of intuition, the spiritual discernment, not the intellect, which is the masculine part, the intellect that looks out there and tries to discern because of what's going on out there now. What's the moral of the story? Never trust anybody in a tent. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> when we quit trying to do it ourselves and call on the power of the divine within, we hear that spiritual discernment from spirit and we're guided into victory no matter what the problem. We are delivered from all our beliefs that are not of truth and we're saved by the truth that frees us. And by trust, and awareness of God's presence, we're able to kill off any negative thought of fear or unrest that is in us. The rest is history. So let's take that into prayer. God, we are willing to give you our mind, to give you our consciousness. Heal that which is to be healed. Reveal which is to be revealed so that our lives can glorify God. In truth and light, we are willing to let go of every belief that comes from fear and separation. We are willing to let go of any unforgiveness. We are willing to let go of anything not of truth, anything that brings us some rest. And we ask your Holy Spirit to bring that truth into our minds, to heal and restore our state of mind. And we just allow it. The battle's not ours. We don't have to do it. God does, as we allow it. I can, I will, I am together. I can, I will, I am. And I pray this in the nature of the Christ. And so it is. Amen.